Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of Adrenal Cortical Carcinoma. We left off last time talking about vascular invasion and made the point that when we look at staging adrenal cancer, we look at the primary mass and we look for extension locally, be it nodes, be it vascular involvement, think renal vein and IVC, and then distant lung mets, bone mets, or liver mets. Obviously, patients who have spread of disease, their survival is measured in months rather than in years. When we look at involvement, we mentioned before that renal vein involvement is more common on the right side because it's a smaller length renal vein. You can see here a very large tumor, areas of necrosis, areas of calcification. When you look carefully at the lesion and you follow it across, you can see that the renal vein is involved. And then you could see some of the neovascularity in the tumor. You see that the patient's left golden vein is dilated, which is often a sign that something is going on in the renal vein. But you also can see the renal vein itself has a filling defect with increased vascularity, which means there's tumor infiltration. You can see it again on the volume rendered image on your left. You see some of the neovascularity on the MIP image, uh, also shown very nicely here. And then, of course, when you go to the venous phase, remember we spoke before you need dual phase imaging. On the venous phase, you see direct extension with a dilated left renal vein, and it goes directly into the IVC. You can see that very nicely. You can see the neovascularity as it comes across. Very uh, bulky extension. The tumor has a pseudocapsule, but there are nodes present, and direct vascular invasion, which is a bad sign. Remember we spoke before that many adrenal cortical carcinomas have a capsule or a pseudocapsule around them, but that does not necessarily mean they're resectable or that the patient will do well. And again, when you go to coronal venous, you can see the involvement of the patient's IVC. It goes just to the level of the intrahepatic IVC, not into the right atrium. But again, vascular involvement, the patient will have resection. They'll do the, uh, they'll go into the vessel, remove the thrombus. But again, once you have tumor in the renal vein and IVC, the likelihood of early distant metastasis, unfortunately, is going to be very high. Just a pretty example of that involvement. Here it is with the cinematic, the necrotic tumor with the neovascularity. And then you look and you see the renal vein involvement with the neovascularity in the renal vein, as well as in the patient's IVC. All very nicely shown on this example. And again, here's a range of cinematic views, which also show you nicely that markedly dilated left gonadal vein. Another case, this patient large left adrenal mass. Patient has liver metastases, which are vascular. You also see involvement on the earliest images in the IVC. The next set of images you see on the right, the dilated left renal vein, the extension of tumor across the renal vein into the IVC. You also see the periodic adenopathy, the liver metastasis, and extreme spread of disease. So again, patients who have vascular involvement have more aggressive tumors, later stage tumors, and a poorer outcome. In this case, you can see the tumor grew up into the IVC and literally is growing right to the level of the patient's right atrium. Again, very nicely shown there and in these examples as well. And you can see in this case, it's surely not bland thrombus, though it essentially never is, because you can see the vascularity of the thrombus in the IVC. And here it is on this high end sections as it goes from the intrahepatic IVC up in the IVC, just into the patient's right atrium. And unfortunately, as is common in patients with vascular involvement, there is already distant metastasis, in this case, metastasis to the left lower lung. In terms of extension, this case also makes the point that although we can see the neovascularity of tumor spread on the arterial map, it's the venous phase that's most accurate. And just to put in perspective, it's just like renal cell carcinoma. The accuracy of CT for renal vein or IVC involvement approaches 100%, and that's an article published from Hopkins Urology a couple years ago. And here's just some nice examples into the region of the right atrium and a lot of the collaterals present in this patient. And again, the neovascularity in the renal veins and the IVC. I'm showing you a lot of cases, in, and in terms of case examples within the same case, since most of you rarely see primary adrenal cortical carcinomas, as we said, there are literally hundreds of cases in the US, and a lot of them seem to end up at Hopkins. We have a terrific endocrine group, a ter terrific adrenal surgery group, terrific uh, pathology and therapy.
but you can see very nicely the extent. Now I mentioned before that PET-CT can be valuable. Here's a case with a large right adrenal mass. It's irregular borders. There's the coronal. It's not thin sections. It's from the PET itself, but there's the PET scan. So again, it's not specific for primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Metastasis and even some benign lesions can be PET positive. PET can be valuable looking for distant metastasis. In this case, the tumor was localized to the patient's adrenal gland, though again, poor margins, large tumor, typically is going to represent poor outcome. Now, another thing to remind people, we use CT a lot in terms of renal masses for preoperative planning. These days... Uh, Dr. Prescott at Hopkins, who does most of the adrenal surgery, will make the point that he always wants to do laparoscopic surgery because it is much better outcomes for the patients a day in the hospital rather than a week, less post-op complications, all of those things. However, if he suspects an adrenal carcinoma, then he needs to do an open procedure because you want to dissect as many nodes as possible and you want to make sure you don't rupture the capsule. So one of the things we need to do is understand laparoscopic surgery is what you want to do. But if I'm suspicious it's a malignancy, I will tell him and then he will do an open procedure. The last thing you want to do is do a laparoscopic procedure and have to change to an open because you realize you're dealing with a malignancy. So every once in a while we'll be wrong, but most of the time we know when something's malignant or not. You may not be positive of the path, but you know it's malignant. And like I mentioned before, if you think adrenal cortical carcinoma, do not do a biopsy. Then you go through the capsule and you'll see the patient's peritoneum and the outcome will be terrible. Another case, large right adrenal mass. Again, it's interesting, uh, the epicenter and how it compresses the right kidney. I want to show a good example of that because sometimes these large right adrenal lesions can simulate a patient's um, liver mass. Again, the enhancement, the necrosis, the calcification. Hepatomas can calcify. Hepatocellular carcinomas commonly calcify uh, when they're lamellar to fibrolamellar type. But again, the epicenter here is adrenal. When you have a, a liver mass, it displaces the kidney, but not compressing it in this format. So one of the pitfalls when I think about adrenal lesions is making sure something really is adrenal. I saw a beautiful example of a patient sent in for a primary adrenal carcinoma of the left adrenal gland, and it was a GIST tumor. Because GIST can be large, they can have modeled enhancement, and they can sit right by the adrenal bed when they're large enough. When we looked at all the images, we knew the diagnosis. So the other thing in terms of adrenal tumors is not every malignant tumor is a primary adrenal carcinoma. We can have metastasis, pheos, including malignant pheos, lymphoma, and neuroblastoma. Now, neuroblastomas are typically in children, though way back when we wrote an article about adult neuroblastoma. So it can occur, and in those cases, it looks very similar to a primary adrenal carcinoma. Some of the other mimics or things we think about, we mentioned Mets and adenomas and pheos, ganglion neuromas and ganglion neuroblastomas are rare but look like large tumors. Hemorrhage occasionally may be due to something else, including Coumadin, or maybe a Met, but can look just like a primary adrenal carcinoma in terms of appearance. And then the rare adrenal hemangioma. So let's look at some examples. Large left adrenal mass with calcification, punctate calcification, not dystrophic calcification, and fat. Well-defined. Could this be an adrenal carcinoma? I guess in theory you could think about it for a split second. When I see a well-defined lesion, incidental finding, multiple foci of fat, and punctate calcifications, it's a myelolipoma. Myelolipomas can be large. They're typically incidental findings. You could see it very nicely in the coronal view here. I don't think it's a difficult diagnosis. I love the punctate calcifications. Fat alone sometimes in myelipomas, as in this case, is small amounts, sometimes even smaller than this, but the punctate calcifications make me feel a lot better. And this was a myelipoma, and just to show you some of the images really nicely showing you that. Here's the case I mentioned before, non-contrast, big mass. It looks like an adrenal mass, and it could well be. Here it is with contrast. It's fairly homogeneous, not very vascular at all. But again, I showed you a primary adrenal carcinoma that wasn't very vascular. But when you look carefully at these images, you see the left adrenal gland. You know it's there. It's right there. This is not the adrenal. Now, with 
uh, just tumors of the stomach. They're often exophytic. And sometimes you're not certain, is it coming from the stomach or just off the stomach? After a while, you kind of get used to the appearance. This is just a beautiful example of a GIST tumor. You see the adrenal on the image, right? So the adrenal looks good, and we see it several different sections. But again, you can imagine the confusion, but if you see the adrenal and it looks good, you're in good shape, okay? This was a GIST tumor, which was resected. Here is the uh, cinematic rendering of the tumor, homogeneous. You see how it's pushing on the stomach? It's really coming off the stomach. Again, the normal adrenal is seen here. So it can be a tricky case, and every once in a while, we always make the point, sometimes large masses, you can't tell if they're adrenal, if they're gastric, if they're pancreas or retroperitoneum, primary sarcomas. So it can be somewhat tricky at times. I mentioned before, uh, primary adrenal carcinoma can present with acute bleeding. Here's a large mass. It could be a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma with the blood present. We showed this case very similar before. This was a pheochromocytoma. So again, pheos can bleed. I mentioned patients on Coumadin can bleed, but the bleeds aren't so large. Mets to the adrenal can have spontaneous bleed. That may be the presentation. When you have a large mass and bleed, you have to assume it's malignancy, but you can't assume specifically what's going to be. Sometimes things can confuse you. Image on the left, there's fullness by the left adrenal bed. But if you look carefully, the patient has cirrhosis and splenomegaly. And really what you were looking at were multiple large varices. So occasionally I've seen large varices be confused with an adrenal mass and someone worry about cancer. I've often seen also... Um, a diverticulum off the fundus of the stomach being confused with adrenal mass, but then it's usually confused with a cyst, like an adrenal cyst or adenoma, and not a carcinoma. Other things, here's an example where you see the adrenal gland, but then you see a large mass, and you wonder what's going on here. Could this be a primary adrenal carcinoma? When you look at the lesion, it's aggressive. It's involving the patient's right kidney. Could this be a renal cell carcinoma? That's a possibility. The patient had back pain, and you could see it's extending by the perirenal space. It appears to be infiltrating the kidney surrounding the IVC. Maybe it's all an adrenal cancer growing downward. It's a very aggressive cancer. You can see superiorly it's into the IVC, up extending near the uh, base of the heart, perhaps. And you can see there are nodes present, but it's a very aggressive tumor. And again, I would have considered renal cell or maybe transitional cell aggressive. I could think about primary adrenal carcinoma. I really could. But you don't see the IVC, but maybe it's invaded by tumor. Then you realize this epicenter, which could be primary adrenal carcinoma, is really along the IVC, the way it involves the kidney. And this was a primary IVC tumor. You can get primary IVC sarcomas. They can, they're rare, they can be tricky, not so much the recognition, but figuring out what they are. And I can make a great case here for a primary adrenal carcinoma. I know I can with vascular invasion. Primary tumors of the IVC are rare. Lyomyosarcoma is a tumor of mesenchymal origin arising from smooth muscle cells found in the vessel wall. A poor 10-year survival. Occasionally patients present with ascites of Bud Chiari. Wide excision is necessary. They're classified according to their locations. And I won't go into it, but making the point, over two-thirds of tumors exhibit a predominantly extraluminal growth while the remainder are growing within the IVC. The ones that are IVC growing, when they stay in the IVC, those are easy. The ones like this ones, which grow outside, again, the challenge, adrenal versus kidney, and then, oh yes, you can think about the IVC. Now, what about this case? In terms of possibilities, now, Obviously, primary adrenal carcinoma bilateral is rare. You can have meds from one to the other. But here you have big masses, and they're kind of adrenal-shaped on non-contrast. And then you give contrast. You can see they're mildly vascular. There's some nodes nearby. So what else could this be? Large masses. Obviously, bilateral, I think about meds. Theos can be bilateral, but they're more vascular. Primary adrenal cortical carcinoma is rarely bilateral, but I guess for a, either of the lesions, you would have thought about that possibility. What else should you think about? This is where people forget lymphoma. Lymphoma gives large bilateral adrenal masses, primary adrenal lymphoma. Most times lymphoma has nodes and multi-organ involvement. 
you can have primary adrenal lymphoma where usually both adrenals are involved. They're large, vaguely homogeneous, but they maintain an adrenal shape. Here it's very nicely shown on the cinematic renderings with areas of necrosis. Nicely shown, the kidneys are pushed down a little bit. And this was a primary adrenal lymphoma. The age group is a bit older than primary adrenal carcinoma. Bilateral involvement is most common in this scenario. Patients could develop adrenal insufficiency, can be Addisonian, so it is a possibility in terms of clinical overlap. They're usually large, over 10 centimeters. And again, that shape looks a bit different than the adrenal carcinomas. Also, lymphoma tends to be relatively hypovascular, can have necrotic appearances, but as we mentioned here, sometimes it can be impossible when they're unilateral to differentiate from primary adrenal cortical carcinomas, pheos, or metastasis. Adrenal lymphoma, again, is an infiltrating process, but again, the appearance can be somewhat challenging. One thing that can be helpful, we spoke about how 70% in some series of primary adrenal cortical carcinomas, or as low as 30%, can have calcification. Lymphomas just don't calcify. Now, when you have secondary adrenal involvement, then you see lots of adenopathy, you see splenomegaly, multiple solid organ involvement, maybe the kidneys as well, so it's a different appearance. But primary adrenal lymphoma can be one of the things in the differential diagnosis, but again, Remember, calcification, the lack of calcification, can be helpful to you. Also, just to remind everyone, secondary involvement of the adrenal glands with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, up to a quarter of cases. Primary adrenal lymphoma is rare and accounts for just 1% of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cases. Here's a great example of a patient who presented the pancreas conference with a pancreatic mass, but then you see a large left adrenal mass what this ended up being was lymphoma of the adrenal gland with nodal involvement in the peripancreatic region. Again, if you only had the adrenal mass, you might think about primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. And remember, that does give you nodes, but never such bulky nodes. So when I look at this, I was thinking about lymphoma. I was thinking about metastasis, but not a primary adrenal ACC. So again, just a really nice example of a case Again, showing you some of the challenges with overlap. So some of the things to remember, despite their large size, imaging often reflects preservation of the native triangular appearance of the normal adrenal gland, where primary ACCs tend to be round or oval. These tend to be more triangular, and that can help you every once in a while. Again, so we showed you this case. Just go through it one more time. Just look at the images. Look at the size of the masses. Look at their enhancement. Look at their position. Again, most of you have never seen primary adrenal lymphoma, so I wanted to show it to you, and again, making the point that it's in that differential of bilateral adrenal masses, and you can see from this list, they did not even have primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. It's under the other category. Now, we talk about metastasis. That's the most common malignant adrenal mass, and it's variable. The most common sites are lung and breast and renal and melanoma but also things like hepatoma can give very large mets. Here's a patient with bilateral adrenal masses, which are vascular. Again, bilateral primary ACC would be rare. So this is more likely metastasis. The patient has had a partial nephrectomy previously. These are bilateral metastasis. Clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the mets, just like the primary, are often hypervascular. Here's another patient had prior ablation of her RCC, now has large bilateral adrenal mets, somewhat vascular. Again, bilateral, you gotta think about mets. Another patient, here's adrenal, a renal cancer, there's an adrenal lesion on the right, there are nodes. Just to make the point, vascular lesions of the patient's adrenal. Pheos is one of them, primary ACC can be one of them. But when they're small, you gotta think about metastasis. Patient's left kidney had been removed a decade earlier. Now you see vascular nodes, vascular um, mets into the adrenal gland. Just a very nice example shown here as well on the volume rendering. Another patient with hepatoma, bilateral adrenal masses. Again, you can think about lymphoma, but it's more necrotic on the right. Patient had a history of HCC. You can see the cirrhosis and prior surgery. 
Hepatomas can give large bilateral adrenal lesions. It's one of the things I notice. In this case, you can see the adrenal, but also look at the pelvis, that large destructive lesion of the left acetabulum and iliac bone and involvement of the femur. So again, uh, multiple sites of disease. Another thing, melanoma. Melanoma is one of those lesions, large bilateral masses. You can see here relatively hypovascular, again large. Could this be primary adrenal carcinoma with a MET? The answer is it could be. But again, that's rare to have bilateral. Melanoma, sometimes this is the presentation patient, a small melanoma resected years before, no one remembers. So you can see how these METs can look very similar. The last thing to mention is pheochromocytomas. They're one of the great mimickers because of their appearance. Age range very similar to adrenal carcinoma. Multicentric, 10% of cases. Again, 10% are malignant. Interestingly, the majority of pheos now are incidental findings, up to 70%. And in total, 5% of adrenal incidentalomas of pheos. So again, it becomes very important as an incidental finding. And remember, we mentioned before that adrenal carcinoma can be an incidental finding. Pheos, the range can be up to 10 centimeters. And you could see for everything we notice here, one of the names of pheos is an imaging chameleon, which means it can mimic adrenal car adenoma, adrenal carcinoma, or METs. So it can be very important in that regard. Pheos can also have calcifications, but less frequently, 10% of the time. They're vascular, they wash out, but so can primary adrenal carcinomas. And um, in terms of judging malignancy, you're really not able to. Here's a nice example, indeterminate right adrenal mass, very vascular. Okay, that's good for pheo. Theoretically, it could be a primary adrenal carcinoma. This patient was hypertensive, then it makes it easy. And look how it washes out. Remember, washout values don't help you with pheochromocytomas. Another case, left adrenal mass. Look how large this lesion is. This lesion could be a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. If it's picked up incidentally and there's no history of hypertension, you gotta think about a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. That's what I would have said. I would have picked that before pheo. This patient on workup, uh, they did, the patient did have hypertension. Some of the lab values were positive with metanephrines, and this was resected as a pheochromocytoma. Again, this is a wonderful example showing you why just looking at the images without a history or without further workup can be somewhat challenging. Another case, left adrenal mass that's large, a pheochromocytoma. Again, think of the differential diagnosis. You can see it washing out, which would be true with most of these neoplastic tumors. Here's another one with a right-sided adrenal mass, large, central necrosis. It's interesting, most of the primary adrenal cortical carcinomas aren't so homogeneous in terms of enhancement, though there is some central necrosis here. Here I would have picked a pheo first, to be honest. I don't think about ACCs as being hypervascular in the same way I think about pheos. But this case is more difficult because look at this case, you see a very large cystic lesion, okay? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So it works out very nicely. This was a pheo. I would have thought a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. So just something to be aware of. And here it is again, just a few more views of that. Central necrosis, a well-defined capsule, just a really good example. And we also talk about paragangliomas or extra adrenal pheochromocytomas, very large vascular map, IVC and left renal vein involvement. You could think about a big renal cancer. You also could think about a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. That's very possible with large collaterals and vascular invasion. This was a paraganglioma, nicely shown on the axials and the coronals, the vascular involvement, really impressive. Paragangliomas are often difficult lesions and simulate many different vascular masses based on their location. And here, adrenal would have been a good thought. So let's summarize a little bit. We've spent nearly an hour, or a little bit less than an hour, looking in two parts at primary adrenal carcinoma. It's a rare tumor, peak incident, fourth and fifth decades, more commonly in women, and functioning tumors are more common in women. It's less than 5% bilateral. They're typically large and enhancing. Uh, calcification is common, 30% is a typical number. The lesions can appear to have well-defined capsules like this one. They can have mimickers, 
because it can be confused with other tumors. We showed Theo's, we mentioned liver masses, we showed a gist tumor, but the appearance is something, particularly the way the kidney is compressed, that tends to make your life a little bit easier. MIP imaging is wonderful for looking at the neovascularity, and that can be very helpful, but it's not always going to be uh, the only helpful finding and differentiating between various adrenal or adrenal versus hepatic lesions. Hormonal abnormalities are critical. You got to be thinking about functioning tumors. Cushing's is number one. But again, if that's not the situation, and that's more common in men where there's no hormonal abnormalities, then incidental findings of patients are very lucky. If not, the patients present with symptoms like flank pain or back pain, things related to metastasis. Again, when you think about Cushing's, you think about pituitary, but you got to be thinking about the adrenal gland. You got to take a look. But again, to remember that it could be an adenoma, not necessarily a carcinoma. We talk about the appearances of adrenal lesions, distinguishing benign from malignant. We've talked about that in other talks. I mentioned the key factor with adrenal carcinoma or suspected ACC is you don't want to do laparoscopic surgery. You want to do an open surgery. So if in doubt, make that point. That becomes very important. The importance of margins, irregular versus smooth margins. But again, smooth margins does not guarantee there's not tumor spread. Irregular margins pretty much guarantees it. So we've covered a lot of information. I hope that's very helpful. You will see an adrenal carcinoma every once in a while, but surely it's going to be in your differential. And if you're a big center, you'll be referred patients. And it's very important to be able to make the right diagnosis. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and see you next time. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.